So I'm Ray First, uh, Vice President of Business Development here at CrowdFunder, and I'm really excited to have a good friend of mine, Scott Sherman, hanging out with us all. Um, and uh, if you are here, you probably read a bit of a tantalizing uh, teaser on, on Scott and his bio. There's a lot to dig in, and we don't have that much time, but uh, a couple of things that uh, I, I like to call out, uh, some of my favorite tidbits about Scott are uh, he uh, is praised by Mother Teresa, was praised by Mother Teresa for his work on transformative action, which he's going to be telling you about today. I can't wait to hear. Um, and also, if you know about the Unreasonable Institute, and if you're a fan of social enterprise, you definitely know about the Unreasonable Institute. He was the inspiration. It was his class at the University of Colorado that, uh, that Dan Epstein and the, and the crew at Unreasonable uh, took, and it really opened their eyes to what could be and that became unreasonable. So uh, without further ado, Scott. Great. Thank you, Rafe. So today I'm going to talk about the principles of transformative action. And this is based on research that I did because um, I was an activist. I was a lawyer, a community organizer. And I always felt like we were losing. People who were trying to change the world always felt like were frustrated, were exhausted, were burnt out. So often we would come home after a hard day of work and feel like, did we make any difference whatsoever? And a lot of us, I, I remember having this conversation where I was talking to people in the environmental movement, and we talked about, we feel like we are people who are on a train, and the train is headed southbound, about to go over a cliff, but we in our environmental organizations are walking northbound on the train, giving ourselves high fives because we're making northbound pro progress, even though the entire train is hurtling over the cliff. And so I wanted to know, how do people actually win? Is there a science to social change? Is there a science of making the world a better place? And so this is what I determined to study at the University of Michigan. That's where I did my doctoral research. And I started with the environmental justice movement. Uh, that was my jumping off point. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with the environmental justice movement. But this is really the confluence of the civil rights movement and the environmental movement. Because it turns out that even though most members of the Sierra Club or the Audubon Society or most mainstream environmental organizations in America tend to be white and tend to be middle class or upper middle class, it turns out that most environmental problems hurt poor people and people of color the most. And that's because if you have a toxic waste dump, you're probably not going to put it in the Palisades. You're not going to put it in Beverly Hills. You're not going to put it in Bel Air. Toxic waste dumps, pollution, it all ends up hurting people who are poorest. Because if you have a toxic waste dump, you probably put it in South Los Angeles, in East Los Angeles, where property values are lower. And so this is a fascinating area to study because it not only does it bring together civil rights, the environment, it brings together public health, it brings together women's rights, children's rights, since women often lead these movements and children are often most affected by this pollution. And so that was my jumping off point for studying, studying literally hundreds of groups around the Uni United States and all 50 states who were trying to win. And here's the great news. People are winning all the time. This is something that you don't hear about in the news. The news is often full of gloom and doom, and we hear all about all the problems of the world. And I remember my, my own educational experience in college was the same way, that all of my classes could analyze environmental problems, but I didn't have any classes that really talked about solutions. And so I was interested in how are people winning? And, and to give you an example of this, in the environmental justice movement, there have been two generations of studies. The first generation of studies asked, is there really a problem of environmental injustice? Some people call it environmental racism. Is this really a problem? And there had actually been 66 studies when I entered my doctoral program, 66 studies investigating, is there really a problem? And 65 said yes. The 66th was commissioned by the toxic waste industry which said, no, there's actually no problem at all. Um, and then there was a second generation of studies that asked, well, why is there a problem of environmental injustice? Is it because of race? Or is it more a matter of class? Is it because 
you know, we tend to put things in poorer areas and due to structural inequities in American society and American history, often race and class are intertwined. But it turns out actually most of the studies showed that race was a bigger factor than class. That uh, companies that had a choice of putting a toxic waste dump in a middle class uh, black neighborhood or a poor white neighborhood often chose the black neighborhood. But I was interested in what are people doing about it? What are the solutions? Okay, we have two generations of studies asking is there a problem and what's the cause of the problem or what may be attributed as the cause of the problem. But what is the solution? Because back in my college days, you know, uh, we would march through the streets and everybody would chant, the people united will never be defeated. And a friend of mine, she was a stand-up comedian, friend Keith B, and she turned to me and she said one time, I don't think that's true. We should actually change that slogan to be more realistic. Let's change the slogan to say, the people united will sometimes win and sometimes lose. Is that what I said before? <laughs> The, the original thing is the people united will never be defeated. Sorry about that. I wish we could rewind this. So, so the original slogan is the people united will never be defeated. And she said that the real slogan should be the people united will sometimes win and sometimes lose. And so that's what my research was about. When do people win? Is there a science to making the world a better place? Now, this is what surprised me, though. As an attorney, as a community organizer, as an activist, Almost everything I learned was wrong. Everything that I had been taught about social change, about what works, turned out to be either not correlated with success or failure, or it was actually significantly correlated with failure. So most of the things that I had been taught to do to try to change the world were completely ineffective and often counterproductive. And given our limited time today, I won't go into that. I'll be taking questions at the end of this. Um, but what worked is what we're going to talk about today. It didn't have a name, but it's what I call transformative action. And what's fascinating about this is I looked at case studies starting in the late 1970s. My, my research took place from 1996 to 2003, but I went back interviewing people who had been involved in cases um, working for public health, working for civil rights, working for the environment, working on all these other causes, economic prosperity. And I went back looking at cases that went back to late 70s through the early 21st century. So a lot of these cases happened before the internet, and the solutions that were popping up, like in an Inuit tribe in Alaska, were the same solutions coming up in um, urban New Orleans and Louisiana. And this was amazing. Nobody was talking to each other. These groups that failed and failed and failed again with the traditional solutions, the same things I had been taught that would work, and they found these don't work. So they were failing again and again and again. And they said there must be something else. A number of groups gave up, but others got creative and tried new things, almost like a lean startup approach back then, you know, where they were just rapidly prototyping new ideas, new solutions. And remarkably, the solutions were the same in communities all over the US and nobody was talking to each other. So when I started my research looking at literally hundreds of these groups and then narrowing it down to the 60 on which I had the most data, it was amazing for me to see this. It was amazing to see that the same solutions that nobody had ever labeled, that nobody was advocating, were popping up independently from California to New York, to Florida, all over the country, these solutions were taking place. So what were they? The first one shouldn't surprise most people who are trying to change the world, which is speak the truth to power. If you are trying to change the world, you need to shine a light on injustice. Because injustice and corruption happen in the dark. They happen in secrecy. So if, again, going to the toxic waste example, if somebody is dumping toxic waste at midnight, it's because nobody knows that it's going on. But as soon as somebody can shine a light, and often journalists do this, um, often citizens groups do this, but if somebody can shine a light to show this is happening, often there's such outrage that that's the first step in solving it. But of course, that's not enough. 
Because oftentimes, we all know the stories of whistleblowers who try to shine a light on injustice, and they're harassed, and they're vilified. Some of them are actually assassinated. Um, and so oftentimes, when you try to shine a light on injustice and speak the truth to power, people in power don't want this uh, being known. If there is corruption, if there is something going on in secret, they want to keep it secret. So the second principle is what really is new about transformative action, which is you need to transform your enemies into allies. Instead of saying, fight the power, recognize that the people in power can be your greatest allies in solving this problem. So instead of saying the government is the enemy or these corporations are the enemy, change it from us versus them to all of us are actually on the same side working together to, to solve these common problems that we share. Some of you may know about this famous study done, I think back in the 50s, by a man named Muzaka Sharif, um, a psychologist. And he was trying to figure out, how do you overcome hatred and prejudice? You know, there are all these theories that like maybe if we just get people who hate each other together in a room and they talk, maybe that will help overcome, you know, and this is known as the contact theory. And it turns out that's not true. Um, it, oftentimes it just exacerbates hatreds. I, I remember seeing a New Yorker cartoon where somebody's at a cocktail party and they're talking to another person and they say, I look forward to the day when we can look past race and gender and sexual orientation and just hate people for who they are. <laughs> and you know, it's, it's a funny line, but it's interesting that this traditional contact theory of if you just get different people together, then they'll see their commonalities. That doesn't actually work. What Muzaffar Sharif found out is the best way to overcome enmity is to put people in a common predicament. So we always see this, this in the movies. For example, you know, you could have the you know, uh, countries that hate each other, but then when the aliens are invading, they all, all the humans bond together to fight against the alien invasion, something like that. But in real life, this happens too. When people realize that they have a common predicament that they face, a common problem that we can only solve together, that's the way to transform enemies into allies, to transform hatred into goodwill. That's what we need to do. And this may sound impossible. Often when I tell people about my research, they say, that can't happen. That's very idealistic and utopian. But the thing that I want to emphasize is that my research, it was not that I came up with this theory and then just cherry-picked examples to prove what I thought. I actually didn't have that theory at all. And when I noticed, when I started analyzing the patterns, I saw this happening. The groups were actually doing this. They were actually able to turn their worst enemies, the people that they had vilified and harassed and said, you are the problem, all of a sudden they said, actually, you are the solution, and let's stand side by side and solve our common predicaments together. And so, again, this had no name, so I called it social Aikido. So many of you know the martial art of Aikido, where you use the power and energy of your so-called adversary or opponent to your advantage. You, your, your opponent may be much stronger than you and may be rushing at you, but for those of you who know the martial arts, you know that you use their power and you go with it instead of trying to fight it and resist it. Social Aikido was a similar process. Social Aikido was about using the power of your adversaries um, to your advantage. As, as improbable as it may seem, this happens again and again and again. But then, what happens next? It turns out the third piece is the most important of all, and that is offer a better vision. There's a story that I often tell where a teacher is saying to his student um, that the teacher has two glasses of water. And some of you may have heard this story. It's, it's in many cultural traditions throughout the world. And into one of the glasses of water, the teacher pour, pours some oil. Now, we all know oil and water don't mix. And so now this glass of water, which is transparent, is viscous and dirty and the oil is all throughout it and the teacher says to the student never tell anyone that they are holding a dirty glass of water because people are just going to get upset 
They're going to resist you. They're going to push you away. They're going to say, my glass of water isn't dirty. They'll probably go into denial. You know, how many times have you, like, you know, with a friend who's in a bad relationship and you say, that person is bad for you. And they say, no, 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 and they start defending them. People don't like having their problems pointed out to them. So when you start pointing out people's dirty glasses of water, most people are going to push you away. And so what the teacher says, he holds up his own clean glass of water side by side with the dirty one and says, let the other person choose for himself or herself which one they prefer. And that's a much more sustainable form of social change. If you want to change the world, stop criticizing what's wrong with the world. Offer a better vision, offer a better alternative, offer a cleaner glass of water. And this is what social entrepreneurs really do. And of course, when I wrote my doctoral dissertation, I had never heard of social entrepreneurship. I had never, I didn't know that term at all. And yet I later found out that this phenomenon that I studied that was happening all over the nation was very much equivalent to what social entrepreneurs do. Instead of spending all their time exposing injustice, which is the first step, pointing out you know, some of the things that are wrong in our society, that's often a way to mobilize people off of their couch and to get them engaged, is to make them upset about the injustices in the world. But interestingly enough, that's not enough to solve the problem. While it may mobilize people to get off the couch, at some point it becomes counterproductive. A lot of you may know this story that uh, it's an old Buddhist story. Phil Jackson, the former coach of the, the Bulls and the Lakers, used to tell um, about these two Buddhist monks who were walking side by side. And in this um, sect of Buddhism, they're not allowed to, uh, to talk to women. These Buddhist monks can't talk to women. And there's this one woman in her wedding dress standing at this river. And there used to be a bridge there, but there was a storm, and the bridge was washed away. Now, the, the river is only about three feet deep, so she could cross it, but she'd ruin her wedding dress getting to her wedding on the other side of the river. And so she says to the monks, can you help me? Can you help me? And they say, one of them says, yes, just jump on my shoulders. So she jumps on his shoulders, and he carries her across he puts her down, and she thanks him profusely, and she goes on. Now, as you can imagine, if you're not allowed to talk to women in this sect of Buddhism, you certainly can't touch them. And so the second Buddhist monk is now furious, and he spends the next 45 minutes in his mind thinking, I can't believe my, my, my colleague here, he spoke to the woman, he violated our vows, he touched the woman, he should be thrown out, and he's thinking about this. Just over and over again, we all know about this when we have something stuck in our mind. And finally, after 45 minutes, he explodes and he says, I can't believe you touched the woman. We're not allowed to touch women. I can't believe you talked to her. We're not even allowed to speak to women. And the first Buddhist monk very gently and peacefully says, I put her down 45 minutes ago. Why are you still carrying her about with you in your mind? And I think that's very profound because one of the things that I found in my research is that while anger is a natural reaction to social injustice and the problems of the world, it can often burn people out. And in fact, what I saw in a lot of the case studies that I looked at is a lot of people who are mobilizing and trying to, to get other people to join them generate so much anger that almost everybody drops out. And the only people who are left in the movement are those who are just as angry. And then they tend to push away and alienate their so-called opponents. They're certainly not winning them over. And so what ends up happening is their movement fails to attract a lot of people, and it becomes very much more and more us versus them. And this anger really burns people out and, and hollows them out from inside. And so while anger, again, may be good at mobilizing, it's not, at, not so good at solving. So we need to go beyond anger. We need to go beyond the first principle of transformative action, which is shine the light on what's wrong. And we need to go to what is better? What is a better vision of the future? Now, I want to talk about one more thing before I'd love to open it to questions. 
We've got people in the room here, all of you following this. Uh, you can send in questions on Twitter. Um, what I'd like to talk about is social Aikido, going back to this. When I finished my dissertation, just as I had not heard of social entrepreneurship, I had never heard of the field of positive psychology. I'm not trained as a psychologist. That's not my background. But I started talking. There's a woman here in Southern California named Sonia Lubomirsky who teaches at the University of California. And I met with her. Uh, many of you may know her work. She wrote a, a fantastic book called The How of Happiness. And she studies what makes people happy. Because the psychology movement, in general, since the time of Freud, has really looked at what goes wrong with human beings. There, there's this whole DSM, this statistical manual, this diagnostic manual, that's nearly a 1,000 pages that looks at every kind of neurosis and psychosis and dysfunction that can happen to a human being. But up until 1999, there was nothing that looked at humans at their best. How humans achieve, whether in sports or music or business or just in life, how people achieve their greatest happiness, their peak performance in life. How does this happen? Yes, Carl Rogers and Abraham Maslow had, had theorized about this, but nobody in psychology had ever done experiments, empirical research, looking at how does this actually happen. And it turns out that my research corroborated this incipient research that was coming out of the positive psychology movement. The positive psychology movement really said, let's stop looking at dysfunction. Let's stop. Um, it turned out there were about 100 peer-reviewed scientific journal articles on depression for every single one about happiness and well-being. And they said, let's change this focus. Let's focus on the cleaner glass of water. Let's focus on what makes human beings come alive? What, what puts them in a state of flow? And so it was fascinating to find out that my own research that came completely outside the field of psychology corroborated this growing body of research um, that's increasing more and more with every year um, called positive psychology. And so it was fascinating to know that the elements that help change the world are the same elements that help change ourselves. So I'd like to stop there because I know we're running out of time, but I'd love to take any questions from people in the room or people watching all over the world on this webinar. So any questions? Yes? What's your favorite story of transformation? Mm. Uh, so there's a wonderful story that um, Dick Gregory, the comedian and activist, tells in one of his books. Um, uh, a friend of mine who used to work in a nonviolent center here in Los Angeles with me claims that the story is actually about him. And it's a story from the civil rights era. My friend, whose name is Sandy, is African American. And back in the 50s and 60s, when people were desegregating diners, they would um, go to, uh, you know, we all know this from history, uh, a bunch of people. African Americans, often uh, whites as well, would go into these diners that said, uh, you know, we do not serve colored people. And they would go and they would sit down, and oftentimes people would beat them over the head, and they would be nonviolent, they wouldn't fight back. And as a result, these sit ins at many diners and lunch counters ended up being extremely successful. And it really was sort of this Aikido approach where a lot of people ended up being on their side. So as the comedian Dick Gregory tells the story, and as Sandy tells the story, um, one time he was traveling through the South in a small town, and he was all by himself, but he went through this small town, and he saw this diner that said, no colors. And he, as an African American, said, I have a right to eat in this diner. So he walked into the diner, and when he walked in, everybody looks at him, and they're shocked to see that he would come in, that he would ignore the signs, that he would ignore what he knew to be a rule in this town. And he sits down, and the waitress is nervous, and she comes up to him, and she says, what will it be, honey? And he says, I'd like the chicken dinner, please. And she writes it down, and then she goes off and takes his order. Well, as she's in the back room, these three big white guys come up, and they go right up to him, and they say, boy, We'd like to introduce ourselves. My name's Koo, 
This is clubs, and this is claim, the KKK. And so oftentimes when I would work with Sandy, we'd work with gang members, and we'd do this presentation to, to gang members. And he, he'd say, you all know what the KKK is, right? And they did. And he said, what should I have done? Should I have just walked out of this diner? And they said, no, 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 you have a right to eat there. You, you deserve respect. And he says, exactly. So he just sat there. And the waitress brings him the chicken dinner. And he starts to pick up the knife and fork and starts to stab into the chicken. And, the, and one of the guys who's still standing over him says, boy, whatever you do to that chicken, we're going to do to you. And here he was about to stab the chicken with this knife. So he puts down his fork and his knife, and he turns around the plate, and he eats his bun. But that's only stalling the problem a little bit. So he's still, he's eating his bread, but he's hungry still. So again, he picks up his knife and his fork, and he starts to stab in. And they said, boy, we're warning you. Whatever you do to that chicken, we're going to do to you. So now he turns around his plate, and he eats his salad. And all that's left on that plate is that chicken. And by this point in the story, even the gang members are saying, OK, man, you proved your point. Get the hell out of the room. Um, but he says, no, no, no. I have a right to be there. I have a right to eat this. And so he turns around his, his plate. Now the chicken is square in front of him. He picks up the knife and his fork. He starts to stab in. And they say, boy, are you deaf? Are you dumb? Are you stupid? What is going on? We told you for the last time, whatever you do to that chicken, we're going to do to you. And Sandy throws down his knife and his fork, and they're stunned. They're like, what's he going to do? And he picks up the plate, and he goes, and he kisses that chicken. <laughs> and they looked at him, and they said, boy, you're a smart one. And they shook his hand, and they left the room. Now, I love that as a story of transformation because that was the ultimate in Aikido of an approach. They thought that he was dumb. They even said it to his face. And yet he showed that he could react with humor, with nonviolence, in a way that gave them respect where they shook his hand, they allowed him to eat in peace, and they walked out. And it is moments of contact like that that start to transform and then even greater moments of transformation are when we go beyond that and work together on common problems that we share. Now we have so many common problems in the world. We've got, you know, people talk about climate change, people talk about, you know, poverty and HIV and all of these that we can work together and we need to work together to solve. And interestingly enough, even with climate change, one of the most fascinating studies that recently came out is we all know that there's a huge debate over climate change, that there are a lot of people who deny that climate change is really happening or that it's caused by humans, that it's something we should be concerned about. And even though virtually all of the respected climate scientists say that it is happening, when you look at polls of the American public, they show that fewer people believe today that climate change is really happening than before Al Gore came out with his movie, An Inconvenient Truth, and ended up winning the Nobel Prize for that, along with the IPCC. So it turns out what actually changes people's minds? Transformative action. They don't call it that. But it turns out if you offer people a better vision of the future, it doesn't matter whether people are on the right or the left, whether they believe in climate change or don't believe in climate change. Leave that debate behind. Leave the us versus them. It's happening or it's not happening. Instead, say, here's a better vision, or here's an alternative vision of the future. I imagine, here we are, we're doing this um, presentation in Los Angeles. I imagine if you were to go out to any street in Los Angeles, Let's say like uh, Olympic and Robertson, they cross, right? The streets cross, I think so. OK. Um, I seem to recall years ago that there were gas stations on three of the four corners. Maybe there was uh, an abandoned lot or maybe a parking lot on the fourth corner. If you were to take pictures of that intersection and show it, and it's probably three lanes or four lanes in each direction, if you were to show people a picture of that intersection, most people, again, regardless of their political affiliation or whether they don't care about politics at all, 
would probably say that's not that appealing. There's there's very little greenery. There are very few pedestrians. It doesn't look alive. If you were to Photoshop that picture and use everything that we know about sustainability, about the native flora and fauna here in Los Angeles, about the local cultures, about all the principles of good sustainable architecture and design, and if you were to Photoshop that picture and that's your cleaner glass of water, and you say to people, which do you prefer? Do you prefer it as it is today? Or do you prefer this as one of many potential alternative visions? Almost everybody says, I want this, whether they're on the right, on the left, or anywhere in between, or off the spectrum. When you offer a common vision, people come together. And so I think we've run out of time. Um, so I'll end it there. But if you have questions, uh, Go to www.transformativeaction.org and I look forward to talking to you. Thank you. Yeah, cool. Wow, this is exciting. And um, I just want to say you're actually going to ask me questions all day. OK. Um, but what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to uh, tell everybody how they can participate in Crowd Impact, which uh, if you do want to uh, transform the world, we have this great live pitch event. You register online at crowdfunder.com. It's really easy. You want to know how it works? Yes. Very simple. If you have a for-profit social enterprise and you are uh, interested in getting people to take a look at your company, give you feedback, we have some incredible judges, including Scott, some incredible capital partners, uh, including Tonic Network and, and Right Side Capital and others. Uh, and everybody's coming together on April 23rd here in Los Angeles. And the way you get to those finals, the way you get invited to those finals, is by creating a crowdfunder profile for your company and getting your friends uh, and, and others to follow you and get noticed by the judges and capital partners. It's that simple. It's free. You don't have to be from the US. You don't even have to be incorporated yet. But as long as you have the intention of being a for-profit social enterprise, you're in. So. Um, invite you all to, to do that now, and we look forward to the next Google Hangout uh, next week. And who is up next week? Do we have that? Yeah, we have Joe Huff and Brent Freeman. Uh, oh. They're going to be talking about social enterprise revolution. Two of our incredible social enterprise partners uh, right here in Los Angeles. Um, can't wait for, for that. So thank you so much again, Scott. Thank you. And, uh, thank all of you. Thank, thank you, you guys. Until next time. Thanks.